You're looking at some images from Syria. Many news organizations, including Al Jazeera, don't always show you the most disturbing ones. But today, we're going to. I'm Femi O.K. I'm Malika Bilal. More than 450,000 people killed, more than 12 million people forced out of their homes, and years of horror in Syria. But six years into the conflict, how do we make the world care? Some of what you're about to see might not be suitable for young children. This regime, they are supposed to protect us, but they are not protecting us. They are shooting us. <laughs> Our job is to save their life through destroying the terrorists. We Syrians are the people who are suffering the most from ISIS. That was a clip from a new documentary, Cries from Syria. It's a very raw look at Syria's civil war. Shocking people is one way to get them to focus on the conflict. Here to discuss how they connect with audiences, we're joined by Yegevni Ofanyevsky. He is the director of the film, Cries from Syria. You saw a little clip of that. He'll be talking to us a little bit more in today's program. In Detroit, Michigan, Heba Dilewati is an independent journalist. She grew up in Syria but left in 2012. Heba has reported on Syrian refugees from the Turkish border. And in Amman, Jordan, Nabih Boulos is a special correspondent for the Los Angeles Times. He's been covering Syria since 2011 and has been in and out of the country since 2014. Welcome to the stream, everyone. I want to start with a video comment that we got from a member of our community. She's pitched versions of this show over the years. Her name is Krista Blackman. She's a media anthropologist. And this is what she had to say. The unspoken issue I think a lot of journalists and activists have is that we have a wealth of images of horror in Syria, both from traditional media and social media, and none of it has seemed to lead to a satisfactory intervention. Back in the 1990s, we had something called the CNN effect, where stories of Bosnia that appeared on 24-hour cable news networks helped craft a policy of U.S. intervention. That did not happen in Aleppo, and I think we need to ask ourselves why. So what do you make of what she said, Yevgeny? She talks about the difference between the Bosnia war and those images that we saw. And today, we see these images, but what does it mean? Remember, I'm not belonging to any media network. My luck as the, somebody who is bringing these stories, and as you know, previously I exposed the story that happened in Ukraine, that I was talking about Ukrainian uprising 2013-14, and then I found myself in the middle of uh, these fascinating stories of refugees that I realized that I wanted to reconstruct the history of the Syrian uprising then that became later on civil war and then became the intervention from different sides that brought to all what's happened. I not belongs to the media. So at the end of the day, I have the luxury and ability to go to learn the story. Not, and I am not kind of binded by any uh, bind, boundaries, boundaries because I'm not related to the media. So I have this luxury and privilege to learn, to meet these people, to basically learn their stories, allow them to voice themselves on the camera, put it in a one big comprehensive story that have beginning, middle and end, and tell the story to the world through all the outlets that allows me through the, allows me through the Hollywood. So I think that's the big thing that we, as the filmmakers these days, have ability to expose these stories, tell these stories, bring them through so many different outlets, because every year we have more and more places like these days, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, they're allowing us more and more exposure of documentaries. And I think these last years I saw the rise of documentaries. And it's a good thing that we have this ability to tell the stories of the people who not have any chance to voice themselves to the world. Nabi, there was a... Well, I have to say one thing. Though. Yeah, Nabi, go ahead. No, go ahead. You go first. Well, I just wanted to say that I think, actually, I mean, I'm not sure the question is correct about, you know, an image that will spur an intervention in Syria. I think it's possible that there's been at some level too much of perhaps the wrong kind of intervention in Syria, for one thing. But, you know, but more importantly, I think, I mean, I mean, over the last six years, Syria logically is the most Facebook to YouTube tweeted war out there. I mean, you know, I mean, back in, I mean, back in 2011, uh, I mean, we had just a flood of images coming out all the time. I mean, from all of these different activists and, and just normal people on the ground. So, I mean, I sort of question the notion that, that there weren't enough images that showed the reality of what was going on. 
My point is, I think, more is just that there's been perhaps an oversaturation. And the situation in Syria is so muddled and complicated that oftentimes I think people, well, especially I think in the West, perhaps, you know, just think, oh, well, you know, it's just one more Arab country that's just, you know, in, in, in this mess. So what mm -hmm. can we do? Right. I think oftentimes it's, it's reduced to that. But I, I, and to add on to what Nabi says, uh, to what Nabi said, is that there is an oversaturation of information, and what people end up walking away with is whatever they want to walk away with. They don't have to challenge their beliefs. And so, if they already have a particular view or opinion or even agenda on Syria, there's so much information out there, they can walk away with everything that reinforces what they already believe in. Guys, and I, nothing that challenges it. I just, want, I just want to say something interesting that I learned through my journey with the Syrian uh, people. <laughs> yes, the, the YouTube had since 2011 a lot of images. But remember, most of these images were uploaded by the activist who speaks Arabic. And Western audience, and I'm, let's say I'm representing the Western audience here in the United States because my story was formatted specifically for the Western audience who are not familiar with the story at all. Because I, who somebody who observed the media here in the United States or in the European Union, I was exposed to the story since 2015 when the breaking news were hitting, oh, in the European Union you have a waves of refugees that are bigger than the, uh, something that happened after the Second World War. So, for example, Al Jazeera and you guys were covering this since 2011. YouTube had it since 2011. Do the audience was paying attention to that? No. Do people in the Western world were paying attention to the YouTube on Arabic? No. I had a friend who are well, journalists. Well, so much in Arabic. I mean, I, mean, I mean, a corpse is a corpse, finally, right? An explosion is an explosion, no matter what the language is, to be clear. And I don't think, I mean, I mean, yes, of course, you know, I'm not asking a Western audience to, to decipher, you know, or to learn Arabic so they can, you know, tell you what the slogans, uh, you know, are said in a certain protest. But, I mean, finally, you know, an airstrike is an airstrike, no matter what language it's in. And people dying and suffering is a pretty universal thing that one can see. Um, I mean, and in Syria, I think, I mean, and, and yes, perhaps you're right that, that, that the West didn't really get into Syria or, or didn't really understand Syria or the gravity situation until 015. That's yeah. perhaps true. Yeah. But I do think that a lot of journalists and a lot of people from the West actually were able to see what was going on, you know, way earlier than that. And I mean, and I think the work of many, many journalists actually has shown that. And I should say also, uh, you know, filmmakers and video makers as well. I mean, we saw lots of video reports from Syria, you know, even back from 011 and, and where people had gone across the border into, you know, what were then called, uh, I mean, I mean, like all these different rebel held areas, you know, back when you only had the FSA and a few other groups, you know, that were functioning. You saw a lot of journalists going in. I mean, I remember, you know, I would spend time on the Turkish border and you would have journalists literally go in in the morning, right, and, and I guess spend some time in Syria and be back in time for, well, for drinks at the bar, you know, mm. in Gaziantep or Antakya. Mm. So, you know, I don't think you're right. I, I disagree with you that, with the notion that the journalists or the West wasn't aware. Guys, for, for you, for you, Hiba, for you, Nabil, it's close to your heart. It's your area that you were covering. But for the general audience, and I know this by two last movies, uh, Ukrainian movie and this one, Every time I was bringing the movie to the general audience and I was learning by going to the festivals, going to the schools, colleges, meeting with the audience, for them it was eye-opener and exactly like you said, yes, it was all exist on YouTube. The coverage of the streamers in Maida, on Maidan 2013-14 so or the coverage... Just, you get, you get me, let me just give the audience watching mm -hmm. a, a little sample of what is, has been shocking people who have been watching your documentary. Okay. Yeah. So I actually want to show you a little clip of, and you may remember this from the news coverage back in 2013, of a sarin gas chemical El Guta, attack. August 21st, uh, 2013, yes. Okay, have a look at this clip. How come somebody kills people using chemical weapons, suffocating them? Kids. The size kids. All blue. The fathers, the mothers, the kids. <laughs> After the serene attack on Eastern Ghouta, the international community got involved. <laughs> 
They asked the Assad regime to hand over all his chemical weapons. Hey, but when you watch that, uh, and I know that a lot of newsrooms, a lot of journalists agonize about what is okay to show the public. When we're talking about ethics mm -hmm. and Syria, as a Syrian, where do you draw the line about what is okay to show, what is not okay to show, what is okay to tell? Well, I work in print media, so we have a little more leeway with that. But what I wanted to say is that with the recent chemical attacks, again, in Khan Shekhun in northern Syria, uh, it triggered a lot of U.S. media attention, not to mention military attention. But then just a few days later, an attack happened on the same town, um, also by pro-government forces, but using a different kind of weapon. And it didn't get the same kind of attention, although it was documented by journalists. So I don't think it's so much a function of the journalists not reporting or filmmakers not producing. It's more a function of the audience paying attention to what they deem important to them. 2015 was a different year because it became a European problem, became a Western problem. Hey, but, but that's um, different from ethics, right? Do you, you skirted over that. But Does, we it, actually go into the beginning of the show, guys. Yeah. Actually, it's all about uh, what media portray. At the end of the day, uh, I'm sure that he, what she just said, we showed on the media, in international media or Western media, only one attack that our government reacted. But how many attacks were this year? Yeah. And nobody was paying attention to that. And they were uh, all on YouTube, same journalists like uh, who is on the well, ground. Just YouTube. I mean, I mean, I mean, they were, they were, also, they were also reported, you know, by by Western outlets. I mean, you know. I mean, we've, did I mean, right did they were exposed this big? No, they not were exposed like the same attack. So that's I mean, the problem. I mean, how can they be exposed? I mean, I mean, at some level, how can people be constantly outraged 24 hours a day when they are not living in Syria or they are not in the region or something? I mean, I mean, finally, you know, let's also face facts. The situation in Syria has been enraging and angering for the last six years, right? I don't think a single day goes by where someone is not killed. And so, therefore, uh, you know, I think it would be hard for people in the West to basically be constantly at attention and constantly enraged. And just to mention the thing about the ethics thing, you know, and, and about like what one should show and what, and what one should not show, I actually would advocate that one should show everything in the sense that people should understand the effect of what these weapons do. People should understand the effects of airstrikes and not just airstrikes, mortars, rockets. I mean, you know, when people say stuff like, let's arm a certain group. I want the person who says that to actually understand what that means. Mm -hmm. I want the person who advocates that course of action to understand that if you give someone a bullet, right, and that bullet ends up in the body of someone, it will have that effect. It mm -hmm. will have this look. And right? Nabiha, you're People, not I the think, only one. Don't understand that. On that point, you're not the only one. This is a Facebook comment we got from Forrest who says, I don't think anything should be censored. When you don't see those atrocities, it's hard to get outraged by it, and it will give cover for people to deny it for political reasons. But on the other side of this spectrum, on the ethics of showing everything, this is another person's perspective on Facebook who says, the larger question is, why does Western media at large feast and capitalize on dead brown and black bodies while consistently giving their dead a modicum of respect by blurring or not showing their bodies. Do you think that that plays into this? Or are, are there questions on who gets to be blurred or whether we should see all of these atrocities? I it's think that's a more of a legal struggle. question. Sorry, go ahead, so, Heba. So, Nibia or, no, or Heba. Heba, you want to go first? I was just going to say that it, it's, it's a constant struggle because there is what Nabih was saying, a dedication to exposing what arms do, what war does, what happens to civilians when um, they're left in front of this war machine for six years. But at the same time, my question is more, I, my concern is more for the actual people being photographed, the actual people being filmed rather than the audience. When, when, when has being on camera in a hospital, tattered and dying, helped anyone? I don't know. Maybe it has. Maybe it hasn't. But sometimes in the footage you see on the endless footage you see on YouTube, you see people saying, put away that camera. Is it an armed group trying to censor them? Is it a family member trying to shield their dead? I don't know because we don't have access. And it's very difficult to answer that question, but it has to be handled with the sensitivity it deserves. There's a, a little bit in cries from free for Syria, from Syria, excuse me. That weapon was the camera, says one of yes, one of the activists in the film. The we the camera is the weapon. Yeah. Did you see that as you were were putting together the film that this was how Syrian activists 
were fighting back with imagery. At the beginning of the revolution, yes, because they needed some kind of ability to expose what's happening on their grounds to the world. So for them, what they had in their hands were the cameras, and they wanted to document the atrocities. This was the first that they hold it, and this was their weapon. And they all emphasized that, that for them it was really important to use cameras against the bullets that were flying towards them, against the atrocities and torture that were basically towards them. So that's why he emphasizing this. I want to actually share a tweet from a reporter who was in your film. This is Hadi Al Abdullah. And right before this show, as we were entering into the, the, the first few seconds of this live television show, uh, Yevgeny was trying to call him on Skype. He contributed via Twitter, though. This is Hadi. He says, media must focus on the lives of Syrian people, their hopes, their dreams, their stories, and their growth despite all odds. So that's what he wants. Uh, members of the media to focus on. Here's a video comment, though, from someone else. Her name is Hala Drubi out of Dubai, and she covered the Syrian conflict. She's a Syrian journalist, and she also trains younger Syrian journalists on, on what to look for. Have a look at what she had to say. The problem with the narrative now is that it's constructed by uh, foreign journalists who sometimes do not speak the language of the people they're reporting on. That's not to say that the work of foreign journalists is not important. It's very important. But it's equally important to empower young and local reporters and give them the say, a say in how their stories are written and hence how their sto history is, sto is going to be told. Sanabi, I'm wondering on your thoughts on that, because so much of this reporting is done by people who are not from the region, perhaps don't speak the language. Well, I have to say, I mean, I mean well, first of all, I know Hala, and I'm a great admirer of her. I think she's great. So let's just get that out of the way first. And also, I have to say I agree with her fully. I mean, I think part of the problem is that, well, you know, I have many colleagues who are, you know, you know, foreign or quote unquote, you know, Western journalists and who do not speak the language. And of course, I've I've had the pleasure of learning from many of them, you know, the craft of writing and things of that nature. But I should say that I actually really question the notion that you shouldn't or I mean, I mean, I mean, there's a problem for me with the dearth of Arabic speakers and people who are from the region, you know, reporting for these larger outlets like the New York Times, uh, you know, and others. I mean, the problem is to me is that it seems that they bring in people who do not have skin in the game. You know, people who are not necessarily, uh, I mean, who don't necessarily have the region's longer, I mean, long-term interest at heart, mostly because they don't have to live here eventually. I mean, I mean, many of them will go back to jobs in the U.S. or will be deployed or assigned elsewhere. Right, and I think there is an important difference here. I think I, I think the fact that you do not have that perspective, oftentimes in many newsrooms, mm. actually, you know, you know, makes for bad analysis and makes for, I would say, incorrect not projections perhaps, but incorrect coverage even. I mean, the fact of the matter is, people should care. I mean, I mean, the person who is reporting, you know, from this region should, well, for one thing, speak the language, but I think also should actually have some skin in the game, perhaps. I mean, not necessarily be biased towards a certain group or another. But I think they should be from the region in the sense that they care about the region staying, perhaps, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean they want it to progress in a certain fashion, I yeah. guess is what I'm trying to Nibi, say. how do you, you grab know? people's attention? Because that's what we were talking about today is what, what techniques do you use for somebody who's been following for six years or maybe who hasn't, who's just been looking occasionally at the news? What do you do to get people to engage with what's happening in Syria? Well, for me, I mean, I, I tell you, for me, it's all about sort of making the stories personal. I know this sounds very broad and cliched, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it really isn't. I mean, the fact of the matter is, you know, what I try to say is that people should see this as if it's happening, you know, in their own neighborhood, right? So for example, I mean, recently I was in Mosul, right? And I covered the conflict there. And I mean, of course, you know, one could talk about that conflict there in sort of this, this, this macro fashion as one would talk about Syria, mm -hmm. you know, discussing the different factions involved, uh, you know, the atrocities and the politics behind it. Yes, of course, you can talk about that. But if you just talk about the fact that someone, for example, couldn't find their mother in a crowd, <clears throat> you know, because she was uh, traveling in a bus, mm. right, and she had just come down a certain checkpoint, and that checkpoint was bombed, so they couldn't find their mother there. I mean, something as simple and as visceral as not finding someone you love yeah. because, of the, because of an explosion, right? Or, for example, you tell someone, okay, so you've been sitting down, uh, you know, in your home, and suddenly you know, there are explosions there, and then you have to leave, and you can only take a suitcase, and in the suitcase you can only take 20 kilograms of weight, and that's it. Uh. You know, how do you reduce your life to that? Right, things of that nature, I think, is what really captures people. In fact, I remember a commercial not so long ago that showed a child in the UK, and it sort of showed the progression of what was happening. I remember right? that. You know, I think like, it was like, it was like, it a Save the yeah. Children campaign. 
yes, yes, I think like so. Exactly so. Everyday right. kid playing playing at home, and then suddenly her life literally blows up. Exactly so, right? And it I mean, went viral. It's easier to go from someone. Well, yes, and the reason why is because it's so personal, right? Yeah. And the fact of the matter is, the people who could then see it, oh, well, this is just, you know, I mean, this is like us, right? Oftentimes, I think people in the West and elsewhere, you know, think of the Arab world as some sort of, I guess, exoticized other, quote unquote, right? And, and you know, I'm mean, with camels and sure. deserts, and that it's a world away from everything else. But the fact of the matter is that people have middle class lives like everywhere, right? Or not so middle class lives, depending, mm. I suppose. But the point is that if you make it personal, that tends to be more effective, I find. You get me, do you know what I noticed from your work is that you use children a lot. Children are your conduit through pain and also empathy. These are three kids who are in your film. This one is Island Cody, washed up on a beach Cody, in 2015. Yes. This three one, year old. three year old little boy. This one is a little boy called Omran, who was pulled out of the rubble. Yeah, five years old, yeah. Five years old. And then this little girl you actually met up with. This is Banner. Yes. Three kids. I, I, I can't count the number of kids in your film. Why kids? And they are crying. They're in agony. They're dead. So many, so many different variations of children. Why? First of all, the whole story started with the kids. And for me, it was important to show from one side the lost generation of the kids, from another side, this is the kids that will one day rebuild Syria. They're still full of hope. And I guess for the first time, I put it all these three iconic images of the kids in one perspective, telling this story. Elon, for me, was always something that symbolizing the death, Elon Kurdi, that the image that everybody saw in September 2015, and it was the great shocking moment for the entire world. Then I'm run. 18th of August 2016, last year, when he was pulled from the, under the rebels. You know what? Amran symbolizing for me struggle and survival of the same kids of Syria. And then Bana, who is full of hope and kind of representing the voice, you know what? She is the hope image of the kids. And together with that, I met hundreds of kids. She was tweeting from Aleppo and people were following her Twitter yeah. feed and her mom yeah. was helping her tweet from Aleppo. Yes. Okay. And it's amazing to see this hope in their eyes. It's amazing. Even in the movie, you have a lot of other kids that are full of hope and doing things that usually the grown-ups doing. For example, you saw the girls that putting the water, finding the kind of the ways how to feed the families. You saw the kids in Aleppo who were burning the tires and trying to cover with the dark smoke their own schools and hospitals in order to survive. And uh, it's important to see all these amazing human things that these kids who just born and then next step they are grown up. So it was amazing to see, to hear their stories and to bring to the world. But I want to share with you the view of someone who watched your film mm -hmm. and was touched by it. This is Hans van der Beer. Have a listen to him. So I've worked in war zones in Afghanistan and Iraq, but that did not prepare me for the death and destruction and the personal tragedies that I saw in this film. Christ from Syria shows the gruesome impact of war on people. People that before the conflict were living like you and me. This movie is a testament to their humanity. After watching this movie, there is no escape from the reality of the Syrian conflict. No excuse to ignore it. That's why I believe that every politician that wanted to keep Syrian refugees from finding safety in the United States should see this movie. If they, after watching this movie, uh, do not change their mind, I don't know what else will. So there was a mission for this movie. Successful yet? Are lawmakers listening, as he says? They should be. You know what? Tomorrow we have a Congress screening. Tomorrow at 5 p.m., we have a Congress screening basically hosted by Adam Kinzinger, and it's bipartisan screening, and we're trying to bring it to our law lawmakers. So we want to educate them. We want to allow them to hear the stories and to allow them to tell these stories and do some changes in the world. So yes, we are on a mission, and we're just starting this. So thank you for sharing this message to the world. Thank you for bringing this, and at the end of the day, we're hoping more and more people will be learning about Syrian people, and changes will happen. Yegevni, thank you for joining us today. We are taking you to the post show. There's a lot more to talk about. Yeah. Hiva and Nabi, thank you as well. Yeah. Online, go to stream.outazero.com. So if you're watching online, you have to go to our website, stream.outazero.com. Have a look here on my laptop, finally. We'll end on this shot here. Cries from Syria. You can watch it now on HBO. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you soon.
Hello everybody, thank you for coming to our post show. I was just explaining to you, Gethany, that there is more of the show. We have the main show, but it is never enough. There's always extra time. This is an extra time on uh, the internet just to finish up our conversation. I, I, I want to give you a hard time about something. When I watch Cries from Syria, I'm watching as a journalist. I hear there's a split between the way Hibber and Abi are looking at Syria and the way that you're looking at Syria. You're passion and you've got to show the kids and the bees like well you know you have to take this into account and this into account what i didn't see was different angles and stories i felt like i was seeing all stories from one side of this conflict i wasn't hearing the free syria army obviously killed people i didn't see any of their video of them killing people i am guessing that some of them tortured people i didn't see any of their video of them torturing people what about people who are suffering maybe in Damascus, in areas that are held by the Syrian military? I didn't hear, didn't see any of that. Are you cherry picking what you want to tell the uh, Western Just world? a second. You said free Syrian army. Yes. You do have generals of free Syrian army talking about that. Mm. They explained that they changed sides from the regime army and were protecting the people. And we saw this in a movie. We do saw the torturing by the regime. Uh, if you were watching this, you need to watch it again. No, no, I, I saw, I saw, no, 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 I, I, I saw that. that. But what I'm saying is, I didn't see. Well, yeah, Nabi, you, you, you pick it up because you, you, you hear what I'm saying here, don't you? Of you, course, you hear the yeah. point that and I'm making. Matter is, yeah. and I think that Ban al Abid is actually a great example of, you know, someone who I would personally, you know, actually not put in a story because I think that, you know, it falls in line with some kind of. Well, I guess, you know, perhaps a more organized propaganda effort that I would personally, as a journalist, be worried about. And I have to say, I think it's correct. I mean, I mean, I mean the picture of Ravana Dapnish, you know, rightly elicited a huge response. But I think, uh, actually, I think I wrote a story not so long after that, you know, where I talked to people from the Western uh, government-held part of Aleppo at the time Aleppo was divided. And mm -hmm. a lot of people were actually, and, and, you know, and, and this was the case on Twitter and Facebook and elsewhere, a lot of people were very surprised that there was no coverage of any of their children being killed by rebel mortars and grabbed rockets that were lobbed, lobbed into Western government-held Aleppo. And, I mean, you know, I don't know if you've checked it or not. I have no, you know, no idea. And but the fact of the matter is that, yes, of course, they're suffering on both sides. Hiba? Yeah, what's, and what's problematic for me as a journalist who's both Syrian and American, and so kind of if I have a foot in both worlds, both the Syrian audience and the American audience, is just kind of this focus on specific icons. Like, all of a sudden, it's one specific child that matters, whether it's in the refugee crisis or whether it's within Aleppo. It's a child within certain pixels positioned in a certain way, and it becomes the center of conversation rather than the larger conversation, rather than the actual um, context of what is happening, which is bombs are falling, certain actors are targeting certain areas, and this is what is happening at any given moment of time, but it becomes an argument about whether does this child exist or not. In, like, for example, Ban al -Abid, that's an excellent example. Like, there were, like, yeah. I think they're called Twitter wars of, like, journalists accusing each other of propaganda, and um, yeah. it just strayed from the main conversation, which is children are under siege in eastern Aleppo, and they are being bombed by government and Russian airstrikes. Children are being hit by rebel artillery and shells in Western Aleppo. And it all became about one child and proving whether this one child existed or not. And it's, yeah, it's, 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 and well. it's the focus. I mean, that was the problem. Yeah, but you and saw it's, in a movie. It's because, uh, and it's, again, it comes from this lens. It comes from this lens of needing to humanize a conflict. And I find that problematic because... Does that mean we're not human in the first place? Does that mean brown bodies need to be humanized? Why, why, like, do we ever need to prove that someone is human when they are killed in a Western country? Yeah, but I at mean, the same we time... We don't hear things about humanizing victims in other countries, and it's, it's problematic as well that children... I mean, I understand why children might be more relatable because um, they're seen, again, as, you know, young, vulnerable, and I completely agree, I completely understand with that. Some of the images that have shaken me the most have been of children. But it goes back to our men, our male civilians, um, not human enough. Guys, first Will of all... Will they not invoke <laughs> enough sympathy? Here and Nabi, I think Yegeni is, is understanding where you're coming from. Let him respond. Yeah, but you know what? You saw a lot of other kids whose voices are allowed to happen in this movie mm. and expose their voices, from orphans to kids who were a part of ISIS and then uh, escaped from the ISIS, to kids who were inside Aleppo. I not specifically try to uh, allow only to ban out to somebody else I mean, there were to be... I don't think I'm exaggerating hundreds of kids, but to my point, 
where, where you challenged me back I, about the torture. Now, I wasn't saying I didn't see torture. I saw lots of torture, yeah. but I only saw one side torturing. I don't think that Free Syrian Army, for example, was torturing somebody. Free Syrian Army was trying yes, to... Really. It, yes. yes, they did. I mean, I mean it's, been, it's, it's actually been proven. It's, and anyway, the, I mean, the word, I mean, the words it's war. Free Syrian they Army don't actually... Killing I mean, each I mean, other. Uh, they don't really I mean, exist I mean, an anymore. And, yeah. yeah, it's an umbrella organization that never really existed in the first place. It's like saying that... I see I mean, it's why like you... talking about the NFL. No, no, I, well, I, you know what, I, I, I try to accounts, allow, the allow the to the voices to be heard and at the same time to allow to the nation talk. Because at the end of the day, this <clears> nation, <throat> like all of us, they stood for their rights, they stood for their freedom of speech, freedom of expression. They were, were fighting since 2011 for democracy. So I wanted to expose their story and tell it to the world, how it started and what brought to the catastrophe that we're having right now, the refugee crisis right, of 2000. Right, but the 2000. story's not that simple, though. It's not just a simple and, matter uh, of people fighting. And if you will go to the Western to world, you do have a lot, of, a lot of lack of knowledge, so you needed to bring at least some simple lack of knowledge and educate here world. Because as of right now, the world completely, and I'm talking about the United States, I saw it with previous movie, and I can tell you right now, because I'm traveling a lot, for the people, it's actually the eye-opener. The movie completely eye-opener. Nobody knew about 2011 up until 2015 what happened in Syria. Nobody knew about Assad releasing prisoners. Nobody knew about Assad torturing kids that were bringing to the, all these big demonstrations. And then literally the same people who were claimed by the media, rebels, took the weapons and started to protect their own families and kids. You know what, there is a lot to be told, and I agree with you, but I compare it to, for example, media. I have luxury only to put a lot of stories in two hours or even less sometimes. And there is a lot of things that maybe I still need to put, and then I need to do a series on Syria. But at the end of the day, I have a comprehensive story that tells the story of the nation. And actually, for me, it's but that's kind of the point. It, I, mean, I mean, two hours cannot be a comprehensive story about Syria. The fact of the matter is that six years of war, you know, I mean, I, personally, I would find it very hard to condense it into two hours. And if you've succeeded, then kudos to you. But the fact of the matter is that, you know, a two hour narrative that covers six years of war, especially when it comes to Syria, is by its very nature reductive. And the problem with Syria, I would say, is that too often people have seen it as a, as, a, as a very simple conflict, when at this point it no longer is. And the fact is that even talking about something like the Free Syrian Army at this point, you know, as if it were a real organization, is, well, quite frankly, you know, no longer valid. Right? And, and, and even the idea that... trying to this reach is a, audiences with a right. simple narrative. We, should, we shouldn't... The narrative, like Nabi said, it's not a simple narrative. And we're not doing any service to ourselves or to any audience by trying to make it simple as such. I, uh, I, I was detained by government forces in 2012. So I do know what it's like. Um, perhaps I haven't experienced what others have to their extent. But I can tell you that when I am translating reports, when I'm writing reports, when I'm editing reports, I used to be the assistant managing editor for Syria Deeply. There is this same torture methods that were used by the government that are used by certain rebel groups such as Jaish al-Islam in the Damascus suburbs um, and such as the more extreme groups like ISIS. Again, it's not simple. There's not one or two actors or not even three. It's dynamic, it's moving and just treating it like it's some sort of football match where you can support one team and keep going on till the end like it's static, nothing is changing. That I, I, I can't report like that in good faith. So I want to bring in um, I mean, another wrinkle into this conversation right, on right. the different narratives, because, of course, this is a very complicated story. Adding to that complication is the images that we see. And of course, your film had so many of them. So we asked our community how important it was to know the source of those images and the video that are coming out of Syria. This is one person's reply, and, and they, were, um, they didn't like our question. So Public Outcry says, the military ops all identify themselves, as do official statements. Protest videos need no source. This question is insulting. They go on to say, which videos? The atrocities are filmed by the nearest person with a camera. You can see what's happening for yourself. With your eyes, uh, implying that you should trust these videos. Now, we got a comment from one of our own reporters here at Al Jazeera. This is Rosalind Jordan. She says, speaking as a journalist, sourcing is vital. I have a duty to tell people who produced what they're watching. It's about the truth. So, Yevgeny, you started at the top of the show saying you're not a journalist. You are a filmmaker. Yeah. Do you still believe that you have that obligation Absolutely. Uh, to source and to ensure that the voices that you're putting on air Absolutely. are the correct Absolutely. ones. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have the full responsibility to check the sources and to, before I'm even mastering the movie or scene, I need to check it and test it many times. 
And I will tell you, we had before a lady that was an uh, amazing journalist that was uh, saying, oh, you, some people reporting that don't know the language knowledge. And you know, because I'm not speaking the language, I had all the time with me Syrian journalists who were checking and testing what I'm putting together. And before I locked the movie itself, I showed it to the Syrian journalists, to the Syrian people who created newspaper uh, in Abbaladi, to the, all my business partners who were involved into this project. Before I was locking every scene, it was always the process that they were checking everything what was inside the movie. So for me, it was really important to know what I'm doing. And uh, when I was doing the narrative, I was checking myself how true I am to the facts that happened on the ground since these years were not in front of my eyes. Most of them were not in front of my eyes. Mm -hmm. I want to show you uh, a clip that everybody who's watching this, I'm sure, would have seen this clip. It's a little boy called Omran. It's the video of the clip. And as Nabi points out, a lot of this video is available on YouTube as mm -hmm. well. I'm going to play it to you because there's something I didn't notice until I watched your documentary where you put this in, which was how when the little boy goes into the ambulance, watch what happens to him. It's the opposite of what you think perhaps should happen to him. <laughs> So my little nephew is about that age. If I'd been there by next to any little boy that was about that age, I would be in there next to him, looking after him. Everybody has gone back and they're taking pictures. Is this the new kind of warfare? Is it image? Is it propaganda warfare? Did, it, did that occur to you, that they hadn't run to his side to look after him? I know they're finding other kids, but there's nobody with him. They're taking pictures. You know what? I think his dad was uh, busy because at this in the same moment, yeah. all the family was under the rebel. So there were other I, children still yeah, coming. So at the end of the day, you know what? I think like you mentioned this before, yeah. camera is the weapon at that moment. Yes. And for them to document this moment is very important. It's more important. powerful than looking after the little boy and making sure he's OK. Yeah, because he's inside of the ambulance. It's oh. more safer than he's between all these rebels. That said so much to me. And it actually took me, I mean, like, that, that's over a year old, that video. It yeah, so it's, it's 18th yeah. of August 2016. Actually, I have real issues with that, with, the, with that, with that idea. I mean, the fact of the matter is that, you know, uh, well, the whole. I mean, I'm actually Amran Daknish is a great example, right? I mean, I, I mean, there were again major Twitter wars and major problems on Facebook with people saying this was fake, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you know, I personally, you know, can't tell. I'm not an expert in terms of uh, you know verification and things of that nature, but. I mean, yes, of course. I mean, I mean, the fact is, it is a powerful propaganda weapon at some level, right? Now, I question the notion that one would ignore a child in pain so one could take a picture. I, I, I find that a bit strange. But, you know, I must say that, yes, of course. I mean, I, mean, I think the Syrian civil war is a case where, you know, images have been able to, you know, create some, well, some outcomes. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at the situation in Khan Shaykhoun, you know, uh, a few weeks ago. I mean, I mean, those images spurred Trump to launch 59 Tomahawk missiles on an air base in Syria. So, I mean, I think there's no question that propaganda, or I should say images, have played a role uh, in terms of creating they certain have. outcomes. But only specific images. Like, it was either in 2011 yeah. or 2012, there was a child, his name was Hamza, and I believe he was in uh, the province of Homs, and his lower jaw was completely blown off. It was a very, very graphic image, and I, and I remember just sharing it without thinking, and I, I was still in Syria at that point, and thinking that something as grave as this, as graphic as this, as a child having his face blown off by, um, I think it was government bombardment or artillery shells, it, it, it would do something, it would have an effect on people. But it, it, it had just the opposite. It was too ugly, it was too raw, and it, it's frustrating. It's frustrating to have to work around that, to uh, find that some kinds of violence are acceptable and others aren't. Again, Khan Shaykhoun was bombed again just a few days later, but with a different kind of weapon, with just normal bombs. And it didn't garner the same kind of attention. Same Not saying that well. U.S. intervention is the wanted outcome, mm -hmm. but I'm just saying it didn't have the yeah. same reaction. I guess I'm just going to say thank you so much for being part of this conversation. We could keep going for another hour, for sure. Um, but unfortunately, we're about to run out of our time on the Internet. So Nabi and Hibber, 
and Yegevni, thank you very much for bringing your insight, your passion, your professionalism to this discussion. It's uh, been a pleasure having you on the stream today. Malika. I'll leave, this, I'll leave us with Anuku, who says, my regards to all the courageous journalists, and I'll add in filmmakers, who've reported on Syria and from Syria. They are my heroes. And despite the fact that we've been talking about it and critiquing it as well, I highly recommend that you have a look at this film here, Cries from Syria. You can watch it now on HBO. Thank you, guests. See you soon.